Flawcast episode 182, Lamenting Over Your Calling. To be a human being is to be in a state of tension between your appetites and your dreams and the social realities around you and your obligations to your fellow man. John Updike. Flawcast. Get in the arena. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all of our fellow Flawedcast Nation listeners, sojourners. Uh, welcome back. As always, I got my partner in crime, Mr. Carl Tuckerson. How's it going, brother? Going great, Mr. William. Hello to everyone listening. It's great to be back. Yes. And we're chomping at the bit for another phenomenal podcast. So yes, that's, get it rolling. that's the hope. And just a, a little explanation. I, I think we finally come to a point where we overcame the technical challenges. It's been like an absolute nightmare here at the Flawedcast World Headquarters with multiple computers biting the dust and just trying to get everything up and running. So uh, shout out to our good friend and former Flawcast co-host, Jason, who gave me an awesome computer last year. So I got that up and running and now we are recording and fingers crossed that uh, we're going to be good to go. So that being said, want to once again, welcome and thank everybody. And we're going to ask you to share this podcast because that's what needs to happen. That's that's how we grow. That's how we change the world and how we uh, impact people. And you can find us anywhere podcasts are under Flawcast CLE or on Apple. Spotify, Google Play, Breaker, Anchor.fm. You can also find us on the video platform Rumble. That's under Flawed Inc. Uh, you can find us on the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Getter, and Gab, all under Flawed Inc. There is a link below in the description. Get a copy of my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. And our email is flawedincle at gmail.com. And with that being said, Mr. Tuckerson, it is uh, your second favorite time of the episode. And let's have at it. Absolutely. Everyone, please take your right hand, place it over your left heart, and repeat after us. I I pledge allegiance allegiance to the flag flag of the United United States States of America America and to the republic Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So this is an episode that's been in the works for a while. And if you listen to our last two, this is going to bookend them because there was a a progression that when Carl and I were trying to game plan what's going on this year or, you know, more importantly, you know, where, where we kind of felt like things were heading or, or at least the direction that God was taking us in for the podcast. You know, we talked about episode 180, reclaiming your first love, like just getting back to basics with Christ. And then last week, we talked about maturity and maturing spiritual growth. And this is something that I personally am wrestling with. And and in full disclosure, I know I haven't been really talking to too many people because I don't really know what to say. I have been really internally wrestling and I have been dealing with a lot of what I think the main person that we're going to be discussing may have possibly dealt with in his life. And and that's going to be the person of Joseph. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 37, but there's going to be a lot of reading. I'm going to do the best I can to read and hopefully Carl will be able to pitch in here too. But I don't know about you, Carl, but I've really wrestled with lately believing that I count for anything. Mm. I've kind of planted my flag on this hill that there was a purpose. There was something that I was created for that calling to make an eternal impact in people's lives. And it's interesting because Mrs. Smith and I have been watching Smallville, Mm -hmm. which I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically, uh, it's a TV show. Uh, It's probably about 15 or 20 years old. Clark Kent, as a teenager and a young man, before he became Superman. And a guy named John Schneider is his dad. And, and you may know that name because he played Bo Duke in the Dukes of Hazard. And the interesting thing about this man is he is the moral compass of this show in Smallville. And he keeps telling Clark, you know, you 
are special. You are different. You have a call on your life. There is a reason you are here, and that is to make an impact, to save people. And how you carry yourself is important. The decisions you make are important. And it really mirrors a lot of the things that I, I've been told through my life and that I've tried to adhere to. And I'm really at a point where it's like, is that a thing? Does it even matter? Like, who cares? Right. And what I'm talking about more specifically is like, does does God care? Does anything I say or do, even with the books, even with this podcast matter? And I don't know if that's something you deal with or wrestle with, because I know you and I have a lot of similarities, especially when it comes to ministry and callings and whatever destiny, whatever you want to word that as. But I really was led to talk about Joseph, who we're going to get into here And we're going to talk about his life and the promises that we find when we first meet him, these prophetic things that God speaks to him and over him. And then the process that he goes through over more than half of his life, from a very young man to a man being in his 30s or potentially 40s, to where things come potentially full circle, but it seems like things get worse and worse and worse. Can I just speak to what you had to say? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I do struggle with those feelings. One thing I think I need to say is that our mind is meant to serve us, not master us. Hmm. And there's a big difference between... Wait, say that again. That was good. Our mind is meant to serve us, not master us. And the mind has to be programmed. It's like a computer. We've had a lot of computer issues at (laughs) World Headquarters. Yes. And the mind is more capable than a computer. We find that hard to believe because the computer can do so much so quickly. But the potential of our mind and the things that we can do at one time with our mind controlling it is above a computer. And when I had the last three years, I will step back and say, has changed my life. It has changed everything about me. I'm not who I was. I am the same person. I'm Carl, but I'm different. And I wasn't made different because I just programmed my mind to be that way. It was what I've been going through that has been the process that has ushered in change. The circumstances. It wasn't just the Word of God and His promises. It was the day-to-day circumstances. And I think one of the things that in life we have to embrace is that God allows circumstances because he uses circumstances, okay? So I think when you realize that he allows problems because he uses problems, and the one thing that I can tell you, you and I are going to have tomorrow is the same thing I had today and yesterday was problems. Life is a series of problems. Some are small and some are big, but each one God allows to teach us and to change us. So to answer your question, and I think we'll develop this thought through Joseph's life and right. studying him, but I just want to put out there initially, every person listening to us is struggling with this issue today. Society is struggling with this in church and out of church. Is Do I even matter? Am I significant? Do I have a purpose? These are not just church-related issues. It's societal. Everyone is going through it. And I think that I'm I'm really excited as we unfold this podcast. And I want to say one more time, because some people may have never heard this, and we'll just keep this a focal point to thread this whole podcast together, is keep in mind, your mind is to serve you and not to master you. And so when I talk about how I feel, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Feelings are real, and we have to deal with them. But when push comes to shove, it isn't how I feel. It's what I know, okay? Right. You can't go on what you feel. You have to go on what you know. And I want to put that out there. Let's foundationally let that weave this whole podcast together. No, that's great. I I guess I'm just taking a minute to open this up and dialogue because I really want to be transparent. Yeah. And I really, because hopefully in the struggles that I'm going through, there can be an identification with other people 
And in that, if nothing else, hopefully they can get perspective and they can grow and, and, and whomever is listening. So, you know, it isn't all for naught. But let's get into Joseph. We're, I'm, I'm going to try to get into this uh, with the scripture as briefly as possible because there is a lot. Um, and I'm going to start here with Genesis 37. We're going to start with verse 2. And it's going to explain who Joseph is. And it's important to know who he is because you know who he is and you know what God spoke to him, you're then going to follow his journey. And you're going to see that the identification of abandonment or purposelessness or that whole complete ambivalence towards everything. And it's, it's here. So the, the, the scriptures are a live God-breathed document, but it's also a document that we can look at in a, in a humanistic sense and say, I bet Joseph could relate to maybe how I'm feeling a little bit. Starting here, Genesis 37, verse 2. Joseph, when he was 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and the boy with the sons of Bilhah and Ziphah, his father's secondary wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his other children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a distinctive multicolored tunic, or, you know, Joseph in the multicolored dream coat, I think, is that Broadway play? Uh, that's where this is kind of based off of. Um, his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all of his brothers, so they hated him and could not find within themselves to speak to him in a friendly term. So kind of where we're at, Jacob or Israel, who the nation gets his, their namesake from, had 12 sons and Joseph was his favorite. He loved him more than the other 12, of whom we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And, you know, he was kind of a rat. He kind of narked on his brothers and they hated him. And, and But they not only hated him for that, but they hated him because he was favorite. He was his father's favorite. Uh, so starting in verse five, now Joseph dreamed a dream and he told his brothers and they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to the details of this dream, which I have dreamed. We brothers were binding sheaves of, ga of grain stalk in the field. And lo, your sheaves stood all around my sheave and bowed down in respect. His brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule and govern us as your objects? They hated him even more for telling him about his dreams and for his arrogant words. Verse 9, but Joseph dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers as well. He said, see here, I have again dreamed a dream. And lo, this time I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowed down in respect to me. He told it to his father as well as his brothers. But his father rebuked him and said to him in disbelief, what is the meaning of this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down to the ground in respect before you? Joseph's brothers were envious and jealous of him, but his father kept the words of Joseph in mind, wondering about their meaning. When his brothers went to restore their father's flock near Shechem, Israel, or Jacob, said to Joseph, are not your brothers mastering the flock at Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said, here I am ready to obey you. Then Jacob said to him, peace, go and see whether everything is all right with your brothers and all right with the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the Hebron Valley and set them to Shechem. So we're going to start here um, back in verse 18 in Genesis 37. He's, and this is his brother seeing Joseph from a while away. He said, and when they saw him from a distance, even before he came close to them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, look, here comes the dreamer. Now then come and let us kill him and throw him into the pits, the cisterns underground of water storage. Then we will say to our father, a wild animal killed and devoured him. And we shall see what will become of this dreams. Now Reuben, the oldest, heard this and rescued him from their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, do not shed his blood, but instead throw him alive into the pit 
that in there the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him to kill him. He said this so that he could rescue them and turn, return him safely to his fathers. Now, when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the distinctive multicolored tunic, which he was wearing. And then they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty for there was no water in it. Verse 25. Then they sat down to eat their meal. When they looked up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, east of Jordan, and on their camels, wearing ladum resin, which is a perfume, and balm and myrrh, going on their way to carry out cargo down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood as murder? Come, let us instead sell him to these Ishmaelites and Midianites and not lay our hands on him because he is our brother and our flesh. So his brother listened to him and agreed. Then as the Midianites and Ishmaelites traders were passing by, the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. And then they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And so they took Joseph as a captive to Egypt. Now, Reuben was unaware of what happened. He returned to the pit and to his great alarm found that Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his clothes in deep sorrow. He rejoined his brothers and said, the boy is not there. As for me, where shall I go to hide from my father? Then they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they brought the multicolored tunic to their father, saying, We have found this. Please examine and decide whether or not it is your son's tunic. He recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. Wild animals have devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn into pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes in grief, put on sackcloth, and mourned for many days for his son. Then all of his sons and daughters attempted to console him, but refused to be comforted and said, I will go down to Shmuel, the place of the dead, in mourning for my son. And his father wept for him. Meanwhile, in Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph as a slave to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the royal guard. So basically, we got Joseph was his father's favorite son. He loved him so much, he made them this multicolored tunic. And God gave Joseph two dreams that they were obviously threatened by. And one of the things that really stood out to me is, I think Joseph was probably a good kid because his dad's like, hey, I need you to go do this. He's like, I'm right here, I'll obey you. Like there wasn't this, oh, do I have, you know, there wasn't like, whatever. It seemed like he was obedient, which to me would lend to be a hallmark of like a good kid. So because of the jealousy from his older brothers, they said, hey, we're going to kill him. And then Judah, who the line of the tribe of Judah, that's the same dude. He's like, no, let's sell this guy. Let's get some money. And then we don't have his blood on our hands because he's our family. But they put such distress on Israel that you can read from this time until about six chapters down, he was just not the same. And we're, we're setting the stage because for me, once again, jump in when you, when you want, but it's this t- speaking of God intimately and specifically giving Joseph a plan for his life, saying that there is something extraordinary I have for you, and I'm, I'm giving you dreams, and Joseph is an interpreter, and we will find that later on. So I believe Joseph knew full well what these dreams meant. Now, he may not have used wisdom. He may have been exuberant yeah. in his youth. You know, he may have been full of gusto. Yeah. But God was still speaking to him. So go ahead. Yeah. So what I, what I see, I sat and listened. And sometimes when you're reading a story, it's a little different. Sometimes when you're listening, you hear things differently. And it dawned on me that this family was 100% totally, absolutely dysfunctional. (laughs) Literally dysfunctional. From the open favoritism of the father of Israel to his other sons. From the young man who obviously was immature to excitingly express to his family that you're going to bow to me, you're going to serve me, and... Of course, we see the father's response saying, what the heck are you talking about? Are you saying that your mother and I and your brothers and 
So it's like when I look at this time period that we're addressing, I see dysfunction, total lack of harmony in the family unit. And I see bitterness and enviness and jealousy that rose up in these brothers. Thank God for Reuben. I mean, if Reuben wasn't willing to throw him in the pit and had a plan to go back and get him later, but he intervened, at least that Joseph was kept alive and sent to Egypt where God really wanted him anyway through this act. But again, it's really hard to believe when we hear this and we look at what's happening here and we see that he's now out of the pit, sold into slavery on his way to Egypt, that he literally was going to save the world of starvation. Right. When we look at this, when we say, where did he come from? What was Mm -hmm. the family environment? What was the family atmosphere? And when we look at all the obstacles that he had to deal with that led him there, Mm -hmm. and we're going to get to the final story But it's just amazing to me that this thought I'm having is, wow, that was a lot of dysfunction. That was a lot of family division and family problems. And, you know, I know we all have family problems. Um, We all, like, have family issues to some extent. But thank God my family hasn't risen up Hmm. against me to the point of planning to kill me and fake my death. Right. So th- it's an interesting story. That's a great perspective, by the way. And I think it, it, it adds another, like, not only that suck, yeah. but it also la- adds another level of relatability. Yeah. My yeah. Family. We know the dysfunction right. that f- right. we have with family. And it's exactly. like, Joseph had well, that too. And, right? even, and even in that, the idea of Joseph being, and once again, he was a young, young boy. Yeah. So there was no maturity going back to what we talked Correct. about last episode, but there was still a genuine understanding and God's purposes for his life yeah. and an understanding and a, a clarity on that. And the fact that through everything that happened, there was just discouragement. You know, not only like the physical aspect, Mm -hmm. but I'm sure that the, like we read about a couple comments here, but I'm sure it's like emotional. Right. He had 11 brothers in however many sisters, like I'm sure there were snide comments and, you know, just, so it it was just constant and and constant torment. I got to imagine. So there is a lot to this story. I'm just going to encourage everybody to read from Genesis 37 to 43. Yeah. Because that's the entire arc of Joseph, and it also sets up the Jews becoming slaves in Egypt. Right. But I'm just going to really hit the big point. So we're going to move on to Genesis 38. So to pick up, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, who was underneath Pharaoh in Egypt. And Potiphar saw God working in Joseph's life. There's just no other way to put it. And he gave him control over everything in his house as a slave up until his wife. He's like, you have control. You have freed reign. I I, I trust you. I value God's favor and working in your life because everything that Joseph put his hands to was blessed. And Potiphar saw that and wanted that blessing. And in as much, God blessed Joseph pretty much everywhere he went. Now, when you get on a little further in Genesis 38, you're going to realize that Joseph was a good looking dude, apparently. Yeah. And Potiphar's wife um, was digging him. Yes, thank you. Um, She was digging him, being in that house. She, I think the King James says she wanted to know him. Yeah. Which is the same as Adam knew Eve and they produced Cain. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, (laughs) and she was persistent. You know, it goes on to say that she just mercilessly pursued him to bump nasties. And as a man of integrity, he's like, no. You know, he's like, your husband, my master, has given me out of trust and goodwill command of everything that he owns uh, except for you. I'm not going to disobey God, and I'm not going to disobey that. So where is she sets him up? He's coming out of where he took a bath one day, and he just had a towel on. So she, you know, she's like, hey, let's, you know, let's get it on. And he's like, no, and he runs away, and she grabs his towel, and he runs away naked. And that was enough evidence to have Potiphar send him to jail. And we Um, can tell how much he loves Joseph, because he could have had him killed. Pharaoh wouldn't have worried about it. It wouldn't have even been a blip on his radar. I mean, it's like, yeah, you, you know, do what you do. 
So he actually spared his life. Right. So you, you get on to start reading further and you get down to Genesis 40 when Joseph is actually in prison and he is put in charge of everything. Again, yeah. found favor. He's put in charge of everything. And one particular day, the Pharaoh's chief baker and cupbearer, an incident happens and he gets, they get, both of them gets thrown into jail and Joseph is given charge over them. And they both have dreams. Joseph being the dream guy interprets those dreams. He tells the cupbearer, hey, your dream says that in, in three days, you're going to be proven right and you're going to be put back in your position. Yep. The baker, he's like, well, what your dream says is that uh, in three days, you're going to be hung and, and the birds are going to eat you to death. They're not even going to be able to bury you. And what happens? Both of those dreams come to fruition. The only thing that Joseph asks is that to the cupbearer, because this is a guy who had an intimate relationship with Pharaoh, Please remember me. Yes. He confessed, I have been kidnapped by my brother, sold into slavery. I don't belong here. I'm not a slave. I've not done anything to warrant where I'm at. And the cupbearer's like, oh, yeah, sure. So two years go by, and Pharaoh is having dreams. He has two dreams. He has a dream about seven fat cows and seven skinny, disease-looking cows. And these seven skinny, disease-looking cows ate the seven fat cows. And he has another dream about seven plush, gorgeous ears of corn who are devoured by seven gangly, sickly looking ears of corn. So Pharaoh called all the soothsayers, all the magicians, all the, you know, the witches, um, psychics, whatever you'd call them. And nobody could figure out what, what was going on. So the cupbearer remembered, hey, Pharaoh, let me tell you about Joseph. At that moment, Joseph was summoned before Pharaoh Pharaoh told Joseph his dreams, and the end result was Joseph was able to tell him when interpret those dreams, which basically there's going to be seven years of plenty, mm -hmm. seven years of famine, and the seven years of famine are going to be the worst that the world's ever seen. You need to appoint, and he's like, because God has told you twice, it confirms that it is going to happen. So you need to find somebody you trust, put in charge of getting ready now for these seven years of plenty. Take a fifth of everything that is harvested and put it in warehouses and store it. And you need to have somebody to do this. And Pharaoh was so moved because all the people that were around him that he trusted just didn't have the ability. And the good thing, the one thing about Joseph I neglected to say is that whenever someone came to him and said, can you interpret this dream? He goes, I can't, but God can. Right. So God's going to interpret it. And he even said that to Pharaoh, he goes, well, I'm just a dude. But if you tell me your dream, I'm sure God will give me the interpretation. And so there's a humility that I believe he's learning throughout this process. So long and short, what happens, the dreams come to be. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge up to everything except his Pharaoh ship. He gives him his official signia, his official ring, and literally raises him out of the prison and, and puts him in the palace. And I know we, we talked about like a message you had yeah. about that sort of, but this is kind of where... What happens to Joseph next is kind of secondary in regards to where I want to talk about. But just to kind of wrap up, long story short, the famine is so bad that people have to come to Egypt because of Joseph's provision, Joseph's wisdom and provi uh, the provision that God was allowing them to have, that people were coming and bartering and trading and doing whatever they could, even to themselves, which is how the Israelites got into slavery. They said, Take us, you know, we need to eat. We're going to die if we don't eat. Take us as your slaves. A little history lesson. That's how the Jews became slaves. But during that process, the brothers of Joseph came to get grain, to get food. Joseph sent him on this wild goose chase saying, hey, you, you need to give me your brother mm -hmm. in, in order to have collateral that you're going to bring me your father. And so long story short, the family was restored. Israel got to see Joseph again. Um... And, and Joseph just flourished everywhere God went or God put him. I guess the thing that really struck me with all this, and I'm going to encourage you once again, read the whole thing because I, we just glossed over six or seven chapters, long chapters of, of important things. But the thing that I, I've just been struggling with and thinking about Joseph is all the in-betweens. God spoke this to me. God gave me this purpose. God gave me this or he could even say maybe, or I would even say maybe, this perceived calling or this perceived purpose in my life that separates me, that sets me on a path different than my, his brothers in this case. 
And like everything went sideways. Like nothing may have gone as planned as Joseph would have thought, or even, I don't even know, ultimately I think God blessed him, but who, who's really to say if that's really what God had intended? I don't know. But what's the scripture where what the devil means for bad, God turns to sure. good? I've just been really pondering those in-between times. Like even at the end there where he's like, man, the cup bear, God used me to do this miracle. And he said he was going to help get me out of here. And I'm in prison wrongfully in prison, wrongfully sold into slavery. I just, at this point where I'm at right now, I feel like I deeply, deeply identify with the emotions that Joseph had to be dealing with as a human. I just, in a way that I've never had before, have been thinking so much about, not so much the beginning, although that beginning is important regarding God's calling of his life, And not so much the end in regards to how God eventually set him up, but it's dealing with what I would say would be one disappointment after another. You know, one continually trying to do the right thing and feeling like you just get kicked in the nuts. Mm -hmm. And I got to believe that other people right now are feeling a similar way because I just know like right now what I'm battling and what I'm combating is not like anything I've ever had before. Like I've always dealt with doubt. You know, I've been told my whole life I'm nothing. I'm never going to mount anything. By people. By people, right, who, who, you know, by all right, shouldn't, you know. Right. And that's one of the hard things about looking at Jonathan Kent, like, speaking life on a regular basis into his son. And, and it's a weird dynamic. It's like, oh, man, this, is, this has to be TV. But what I want to talk about and, and what I want everyone to start to think about is there are real moments in the text that we're sharing with you that I got to believe that Joseph was in complete despair. You know, Potiphar's wife coming after him and coming after him and coming after him and then setting him up. I mean, that had to be crushing. And then going to prison in many ways, it maybe almost would have been easier to him just like, okay, I'm done. And, you know, hang them or you know, whatever they do back then, guillotine or whatever. But the thought of, you know, I've been faithful and this person lied because I was doing the right thing. And now I'm in prison. I was a slave, but now I'm in prison. I'm in a lower perceived point in my life. And I just, I don't know how to process that right now. Because for me, and this is where I guess, you know, one of the benefits of the podcast is it is kind of cathartic. It's coming in a way that it's so intense and it's so ferocious and it is so consistent this, this battle, this, this even belief that not even that I have a purpose or a calling, but that, that I am not a complete worthless piece of crap. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just being honest because, you know, hopefully it'll help somebody, but. Well, there were titles to Joseph. Let's, let's break this up. Sure. People said that Joseph was a slave. And in reality, he was because his brothers took a payment for his life. 20 pieces of silver. So if you want to embrace what you are based on what people say you are, then Joseph is nothing more than a slave, first of all. Now, he didn't get put in prison because he wouldn't sleep with Potiphar's wife. He got put in prison because he was righteous. It's just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't go into the fiery furnace because... They wouldn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar. They went in the furnace because they were righteous. Daniel. Daniel didn't go to the lion's den because he continued to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem and then got caught. And then King Darius said, oh, no, what have I done? I've made this decree. And now my best buddy, I got to throw in the lion's den. (laughs) Daniel went in the lion's den because he was righteous. And so foundationally and at the root of the core, every one of us are going to have something in our life that is going to put us in a position. And we're going to be able to point to it and say, it's because my brothers hated me and they put me in a pit because they wanted to kill me. Or we're going to say it's because I wouldn't have slept with Potiphar's wife. And so she lied and I went to prison and how could you let this happen? Or... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, great, now we're going to end up like a steak over fried by going into the furnace because we wouldn't bow to Darius. But 
the reality is the common thread that all of these men had when they went through their trial was righteousness put them there. Holiness put them there. And in our life right now, ever since, and I keep going back to COVID, I can speak to my life that something changed in the spirit world, in the spirit realm, in the heavenlies, currently in this time frame on earth. What I feel in my spirit, what I'm sensing in my spirit while I'm in this world, something happened. There was a shift, and I don't know if it was coincidentally at that time period or if it was meant to be that that made such an impact on me. It was during that time of isolation and lie and debauchery and death and evil like I've never seen that it was like the windows of the spirit world became more real in my life. And I sensed it in my feelings, how I felt. My mind became tormented continually. I was not having consistent rest, consistent peace, consistent calm. There was this era of unknowingness and newness that I entered into, and I hope I'm not alone, I began to recognize what you're speaking today in this podcast was that, do I even matter to, and here's the thing, I don't care about the people, that's irrelevant, Mm. but to God, that was the real Mm. earth shaker, is to God, if I mattered, would I be here? Would I be going through this? Is this what you called me for? Is this what you set me apart for? And I think it's so interesting that at a young age, I think really almost too young for Joseph to be able to handle his future because he got excited. He was thrilled. He was moved. And he shared that. And... I think when you have a longer life as you get older, it's very important to be certain about what you know. Because if you're not, how you feel will begin to combat what you know. You will begin to have an inner struggle. You will begin to have a mental battle. You will begin to have physical anxiety and questions that says, I am not a teenager anymore with a future ahead of me. I am not beginning this life journey where I've made a commitment to you and I know I feel called and I feel like I'm going to be used and I feel like you have a purpose for me. But when we get to this age, I think it starts in our 50s, close to our 50s. We realize, wait a minute, When I was 18, it was easy for me to say, well, I haven't arrived yet. There's no verifiable evidence that I am going to do something great for God because I'm too young. It hasn't happened. Right. As we get older, and I imagine it happened to Joseph, probably, I would assume, sitting in prison because he was no longer 17. He was in his late 30s, at least mid-30s. And he had these dreams and this confidence, and he knew that there was going to be this position he was going to enter into and that God was using him and that God had his hand on his life. And I wonder, like you said, in the day-to-day life between here and there. Right, because it isn't so much in the fact that you and I can get together and we can encourage one another, right? After we part ways, and I don't know for you, but... And I thank you for wording that the way you did, because it it isn't, do I matter to my friends? Because as humbly as I can say, I I hope I do, because why would you be my friend? And I kind of think we know we do in reality. But it is the whole thing, like you said, like, I'm here, God. As a young man responded to what I believe was a invitation. And here I am, 46... There has been moments, but every moment has usually ended up in agonizing defeat, Mm -hmm. having my ass handed to me 
over and over again. And you come to this point where, and I, I think like you're saying, Joseph's in prison. Like, what did I do? Where, right. did, where did I miss the boat? And was I wrong? You know, was, was I just full of piss and vinegar when I was young? And I just, you know, had swayed no, by the influence right. of people above me, Christian leaders and right, right. people that would speak into us and say things to right. us that, and, and people who were in positions that maybe we wanted to be in sure, one day. or it, So, so yeah, I, I love the way you worded that because very precisely, that that is the crux. And for me, and I can't speak to anyone else, I feel like the last 25 years of my life, I, it's been propelled this way. I've made decisions or, or rejected things or worked towards things for a singular purpose, which ultimately was serving God in a some type of full-time capacity where like with this podcast it isn't even the numbers it's the message that we get from you guys every week that says hey this this and this and 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 this meant something to me or that meant something to me or and I really was challenged by this and and having no evidential circumstantial evidence to present to say yeah this yeah that blah 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 and at some point, and maybe, maybe this is just it, you know, with Joseph, for example, like, I'm here, you know, I'm stuck. Like, how can I be one with these promises when I'm at, in the bottom of the bottom of the bottom? Well, we think that the rise to the top has to happen a certain way. And what, what I mean by the top is like, I mean, to not dwell in the basement of thought, in the emotional cellar. Right. Of depression or wonder or question or just lack of certainty. And it's like, it isn't that I need to be a pastor of a church or a mega church. It isn't that I need to have a media outlet that brings a crowd to me. That isn't what would validate to me that I'm doing what pleases God. That's not it. That would be verifiable evidence to certain people. And I think I lived my life that way for so long, projected to make the big splash, on the path of making a big splash, making mini splashes, having certain opportunities. But certainly, if we were to compare our individual life in comparison to Joseph, truly as a 15-year-old at that time, and then even going forward, this is not where I projected my life through my relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. in this field, in this ministry opportunity, in this even role of father position. I, I didn't see myself here. I saw myself differently. In the past, I would have said farther along. I would have said making a greater splash. That was how I gauged whether or not God had a special relationship with me. And that was probably immaturity on my part, being younger. But now I think in the last three years of my life, I've matured enough to say that it's been in the broken, the brokenness it's been in obscurity and in, in doubt and in hurt and in pain and in fear and agony that was legitimate of circumstances and relationships that just vacated, literally gone out of my life and from this earth was that all of these things in the last three years have changed and transformed my idea of God being happy with me or his validation in my life to make an impact or to make a difference or to have any verifiable evidence that society would recognize in my upbringing and my training, my education, in my labels of do I matter? Is this right? God, did I miss the tea leaves? Was I a little emotional? And did, did people maybe play on my emotions? Did I think I heard 
from you and now I'm reevaluating, I can honestly say that for me, it has been the brokenness. It has been the pain. It has been the loneliness and the questions. It has been all of these things that have drawn me closer to God than I have ever been in my life. And it makes sense because the Bible says that God is drawn to the brokenhearted. And so for me, I think the shift is let all of the ministry ideas I ever had go. Let all of the accomplishments and the accolades and all of the validations of how I really am called into ministry because I am doing the traditional things that those people do, I would say that if God set me in motion and designed me and fashioned me and planned for me and breathed the breath of life in me when I was conceived and I lived all of this life and he brought me to the point in my life now where I can say if all of that was just so him and I could have this unique, special, intimate, loving, deep, close relationship, and that that's what pleases him, then so be it, and I am validated. I am successful. I am serving my purpose to him, because as a God and a creator of the universe— if he fashioned me to just simply have special, unique intimacy with him, and I am seeking that, and it came through my pain and my doubt and my feelings of lowliness and unworthiness and my pain, my agony, if that is what brought me to the point of brokenness where I opened up and him and I had that unique relationship that he reserves for the brokenhearted because he's drawn to them, then I am validated. And that was my purpose. And that was my reason. And I can say wholeheartedly that if that's all there is, I am above all favored. I am blessed. I embrace the depth of that. I consider that an honor and I will live my life that way. And all of these other ideas that I have for ministry and opportunities that I have for ministry, they now, with change of perspective and the change of relationship with God, they will always fall in line. They will always mean less. They will never mean I have achieved, succeeded, arrived, made the right decisions. They now don't. And I think in the past, Mr. William. That was what I was looking for. That was what guaranteed me that I had made the right decision for those opportunities to present themselves. And I think that's how Joseph was able to stay righteous and became better instead of becoming bitter was because if he never made it from the pit to the prison to the palace, and he would have always remained either in the pit and never got out or the prison, I think It was that intimacy and that favoredness that he validated in his heart that he knew. And that's why I say it's so important that you believe what you know more than what you feel. Because I feel what you're talking about. I have felt what you are talking about. Everyone listening to us right now has felt or is feeling battles, the insignificance, and the I missed the mark. And that what was it all about? And did I mess up? Or is there really a purpose? Or am I just another Joe Schmo that bought into something? So I know how you feel. And I battle that. But I've learned that my mind will always serve me. It will never master me. And that's why, as we've talked about in so many podcasts, I can't start my day without shaping my mind. I can't. I cannot miss a day anymore without giving it, whether I get up early, like I, like I said in the last podcast, and sacrifice that, that is my offering to God. That's the first part of my day is the first fruit of my day. It's my tithe. It's my offering. It isn't monetary, but we're entering an era that's different. Spiritually speaking, this is different 
there is battles. There are battles taking place spiritually that are hindering us. It's deep, it's powerful, and we can't win. We can't win on our own. We can't win because we don't have the authority to combat those princes of the air. But God does. Jesus does. Right. The Holy Spirit is daily. I think that is a challenging but proper insight and perspective. And all I can do, and I think all we can do, is just present the the issue that we're we're or I'm dealing with or you're dealing with or have dealt with in a real human manner and and say that there are but other humans that we should be able to relate to because ultimately you know whatever God told Joseph in his youth came to be in his adulthood yeah middle age probably same with David right and you know I have my alarm set uh I have a lot of alarms set but uh 938 every night Matthew 9, 37, 38 says, do not pray to the Lord of the harvest for the harvest, but pray that workers will go into the harvest field. I'll say this then. I really like you to pray to close this episode out. But, you know, it's these things that's like when Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you pray that because that's why I set the alarm to say, you know, Lord, send workers into the harvest field. And you're like, here I am, send me. And it's a daunting thing to think. I'm fourth string bench warmer. And, you know, here, here it is. But I really think what you said was powerful. I'm gonna, and as I edit this and as it's published and I go back and listen to it, uh, I'm hoping that God will use it to encourage me and, and everyone listening. So can you pray this out on this episode? And, and, and uh, you know, whatever, obviously, God lays on your heart. But I, I believe that people are dealing with these things. I, I, I just see it. Um, in people's faces, whether they own up to it or not. So uh, I would hope that you and I would be bold to say, yeah, we're insecure about this. Or the about beauty that, is you know? being no different and no better than anyone else. Right, yeah. And just basically opening up and quit playing. Like, we don't pretend on our podcast. Right. And we don't do that. And it's like, I may have made references in the past to the struggles that I had been going through. But we, in reality, it's directly tied to what you said or oh, exactly the same mm-hmm. about this bombardment in my mind. Literally, right. just my oh, yeah. thought it- process that leads to how I feel and how I feel was leading to how I acted and mm-hmm. they became so intermingled between what I think and how I feel and how I act. And now it's who I am. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it, it leads. And, that, that. and that's the danger. That's the danger. Yeah. Well, let, let's go ahead and pray. Do it. Jesus. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this topic. It's not unique to us. I know all people battle in their mind. And I know that in society, we say that there's been a mental health awareness and your word was long aware of the importance of mental health long before this society decided to put a movement in motion, speaking to mental health. God, your word all throughout your word talks about guarding our mind and shaping our mind and So how a man thinks is how he speaks is how he lives. And Lord, the daily shaping of our mind and and protection. God, I pray that we would commit to giving you that time, that alone time and that intimate time to get our marching orders each and every day. Whatever changes have to be made practically in our life with our schedules and our lifestyles, that what we're doing in the morning would begin to shift to nothing is more important in my morning than first getting in your presence and letting you validate me for the day. Because God, in this world as we live, there is so much invalidation taking place. There are so many labels being put upon us, and there are so many issues, and there's such a spiritual warfare taking place that to navigate our way through, we have to have your light shining in darkness. And so, God, I pray that 
somebody that's listening would make a change. It isn't about repentance, and it isn't about asking for forgiveness. And if someone has to do that, Lord, please, that would be the greatest honor to think that this podcast would lead them to the point of repentance. But for those of us who have begun to live life to please you, strengthen our minds. God, strengthen our hearts and let us believe more of what we know and less of what we feel, God. Let us stand on what you've promised us, no matter what it looks like or what it feels like, or even more importantly, how it is right now, God. Nothing is more important than our intimacy with you. Nothing is more validating than our relationship with you. And so, God, as we end this podcast, I pray that someone would be touched, someone would be moved, someone would respond that they would shift and they would commit to prioritizing you to shape their mind and form their thoughts and speak to them every single day. God, I pray you protect us and keep your hand on us until we come back next time. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So uh, thank you for praying. Um, And thank you guys for listening. Uh, Please share. Uh, Once again, we are asking you to share. Uh, you can find us anywhere podcasts are under Flawedcast CLE. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, Breaker, Anchor.fm. We are also on the video platform Rumble. That's under Flawed Inc. You can find us on the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gab, and Getter. Also under Flawed Inc., there is a link below to get a copy of my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. Uh, our email is flawedincle at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, and hang in there with us uh, because we're going to do the best we can. So see you guys later.